Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? My name is Eric. I am here today with fantasy nap expert Michael Kester. Wow. We got some goddamn films here today. Yeah, we do. What are we doing? We're going to do Coraline and Little Nemo Adventures in Slumberland. All right. So I think we see the kids' film stuff at first. Yeah. But I think there's way more. Oh, yeah. Here. For sure. Uh, I'm going to call this our I'm trying to get Neil Gaiman to listen to our show episode uh-huh. double feature. Uh, we'll see if we can successfully accomplish that. We have spoilers coming up. We're going to talk about the films in their entirety from start to finish, front to back. That includes the ending. Right. So you're going to know what happens at the end. Mm-hmm. If you haven't seen Coraline, don't listen to this fucking show. Go watch Coraline and come back. If you haven't seen Little Nemo, if you don't know what Little Nemo is, furthermore, I'm going to explain that to you first. <laughs> and then uh, go see Little Nemo and come back and watch this. That's why we have chapters. Using the chapters, you can. it's kind of like pausing. It's an advanced... A uh, deluxe version of right. pausing. The premium pause is what chapters are. Wow. You just select your menu nonsense up and there. And for free. And you, yeah, right. <laughs> premium and free. This show is a terrible business model. So uh, basically what I'm getting at is you just pick where you want to go in the show. Use the chapters menu. If you don't know what a chapters menu is, use Google because I've already rambled for a long time. <laughs> Um, why don't we start talking about Coraline just because that's where I'm more comfortable. Dowsing is made up. Yes, dowsing. Uh, we we start the film with dowsing. Yeah. It, oh, you, what, okay. So some people don't know what dowsing is, and okay. for those people, dowsing that is total bullshit. Uh, but how would you define this? Well, this is something we don't get a lot of. In I would. The United I wouldn't States. define it. I would explain it as somebody finding water with magic sticks. Right, but doesn't the, work. The, the part of the definition there is the problem with that is that it you can't actually find water simply by they hold on to these sticks. And they think, I mean, if you saw Coraline, as I just fucking instructed you to do, then you've, you've seen it. You think you can find water underground using this, uh, this stick. It's, you know, it's the idiomotor effect, the response. Um, you're basically, you are muscle memory in your body is forcing you to move the stick and you don't even realize it. It's not telling you, there's no scientific evidence to support the fact that this twig will show you where water is right. underground. However, people are in denial about that. So thusly dowsing is still a thing that people, I think just in Australia, right? Not to just pick on the Australian listeners, but I'm pretty sure that's the only place that's prevalent. So dowsing leads us to the big hamster well, which kind of kicks off the movie. Yeah. Some hamster style hamster well kicks off and of course ends the movie because that's just what you do with your hamster style. So there's two names I think you need to talk about in a movie like this. We Dakota talk- Fanning. Yeah. <laughs> no. We could talk <laughs> about the cast. We could do that because uh, some people show up in here and the roles are all good. And But that's pretty um, That's pretty regular for mm-hmm. kids' films. Today. Right. For sure. Quote, unquote, kids. I'm just going to stop doing that, right? I'm going to stop saying kids' films because I don't think, I don't feel like the creators of Coraline made it to be a kid's film. Right. I don't think it's the usual, you know, Shrek nonsense. Yeah. I think it's a movie that just happens to have a look of animation to it, despite mm-hmm. the fact it's, you know, stop motion. And that's why people always say, for kids film this or for kids film that. I'm going to treat Coraline like an adult film because I'm a fucking adult and those are the kind of movies I own. But what are the two names, the actual two names you should know? Neil Gaiman and Henry Selleck. Yes. Let's take them in reverse order. Perfect. Uh, so you know Henry Selleck. Yeah. Henry Selleck directed uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, which we did last year with what? Rocky Horror Ro- Picture Show. That's right. I believe that was our Fuck You show. That was uh, our Fuck You yes. Halloween show, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, Furthermore. Yeah, um, also, James and the Giant Peach was Henry Selleck. Oh, that's well, right. right. Yeah. yeah. So Henry Selleck being a master of stop motion. That's what he is most well known for. And this will be the only time this, uh, you know what? I don't even want to say the name because then I have to tag it. But there is a certain person who is also associated with Nightmare Before Christmas who unfairly gets attached to all of Henry Selleck's movies. Uh, You know that guy that Mm -hmm. I'm talking about, right? right? This man's The Nightmare Before Christmas, that guy, the this man. Right, sure. uh, Unfairly just gets attached to all these Henry Selleck projects. It had nothing to do with Coraline. However, in the advertising you want to attach some kind of name. So what you say is, 
it's from the creator of the nightmare before christmas which is accurate because yeah. henry Selick was the fucking guy right with danny elfman of course who made the nightmare before mm-hmm. christmas so a lot of people came away from Coraline saying it was made by that other guy which is just kind of a shame if there was another guy though it would be neil gaiman just give me in a nutshell i believe you could do this in under 20 seconds okay. every single fact you know about neil gaiman uh writes cool characters there's another movie i know you know there's oh, you another, movie. another movie i really hope your sister isn't listening to the show she'll be so mad uh mirror mask yes mirror mask is the other one so when we were looking at our schedule we we're kind of going oh could we stick mirror mask in here too and it's a little sad to me how similar Coraline and mirror mask are that was the only thing that i was so excited when i saw Coraline for the first time the only thing that bummed me a little bit is i kind of already knew what was going on because i had seen mirror mask Mirror Mask was another, uh, Neil Gaiman, you know, big writer, big, big, big writer. Does a lot of comic book stuff, just a lot of fucking fantastic stuff. Did Sandman, which is a huge comic. Recently did that thing uh, with Amanda Palmer called Who Killed Amanda Palmer, right. which is kind of a play on the Twin Peaks Who Killed Laura Palmer thing. And uh, just awesome. So all that stuff, awesome. But he does a lot of these stories that are escapism. You know, there you see that in Coraline, and that's the same kind of story with Mirror Mask. Right. Someone who is not usually a child who's not fulfilled with their uh, their normal day to day living, and as a child, who fucking is mm-hmm. right? Everything is boring. Adults are boring. No one listens to your stupid stories, and so you retreat into this world, the you know the other world. Right. You retreat into the fantasy world. Sure. Something that some of the most creative filmmakers, I mean, you look at the Del Toro stuff revolves around a lot of that, too. That was Pan's Labyrinth. Right, for sure. You know, that same kind of idea. And something that lends itself really, really well to a lot of creativity. So normally we would just pull apart the movie, look at all these different aspects. Why is it notable? But man, with Coraline, I pretty much just want to talk about the fucking creativity. Because that is... I mean, I, I don't know. Give me your take. I think that's the best part of it. Oh, I yeah. Think well, that's what there it is. It carries to look the at. film. It's, yeah. what, it's what the film is there for. Coraline is not only a creative film, it's something that's consistently creative. It's constant creativity throughout the movie. Where uh, other movies, I feel bad calling out other directors, but we talk about this with Spielberg sometimes. Uh, Spielberg builds creative worlds, and then you're kind of done with the world about three fourths of the way through right. the movie. A lot of filmmakers, the filmmaker whose name I refuse to mention in this episode, is known for building some creative worlds and worlds that, uh, you know, wear themselves out. If there is a single fucking problem with uh, movies that I see, I would say eh, maybe 60% of the movies I see a year, the problem is that they have something going for them and it just doesn't quite pull it along far enough. And that's an area where I think Coraline exceeds exponentially. The world never wears on you because it's always moving. You know, just right about when you get comfortable with it, it switches, it, it just switches everything on you. Um, you look at the different phases of this film from Coraline's world, you know, the real world to the kind of other world she first encounters. Right. Uh, and then to even the, the alteration of that world itself. Every time you think you have one figured out, we jump into another one where there are completely new characters completely new things to look at, new rules to learn. Uh just an over it's it's almost overwhelming and when right. you're watching it to try and adjust to all of these new surroundings all the time. But let's just kind of take those in order. I mean, all right. So we have Coraline's world, the real world. So it's all, it's really gray. Um gray is probably the word to describe it, right? Yeah, I mean it's gray, it's bland, everybody ignores her, the dude upstairs has a wiry mustache. Yes. I mean, <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah, uh so you you have her home life, which is the grayest part of her world. You have her parents. Her parents seem to pay no attention to her. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're busy, right? That's, I guess. That's they're, the what, they're writing and editing a book about plants or something? I mean, how much more fucking gray do you get right. a book about plants? One of our botanist listeners is surely going to send us an angry email for that one. You know, the, when she goes to the clothes store, she points out even that all of the clothes right. are gray. Uh, but I don't think the world itself is boring. From the beginning, you have the stop motion that makes you interested. Sure. Anytime you see... Stop motion, anything. Uh, the Fantastic Mr. Fox is something I saw um, not too long ago. And you know what? Another one of those movies that, while well, I thought had a lot of creativity going for it, by the end, it just sort of wore out its welcome. Yeah. It seemed to stop coming up with fresh, new, amazing mm. things. Within the first two minutes of the movie, we've all adjusted the fact it's stop motion and, ooh, look, isn't that cool? Right. The gimmick of that has worn off. 
it might have bought itself two and a half minutes for some people because it's apparently also in 3D. Yeah. Although I wouldn't know any fucking thing about that. Yeah. I ended up seeing this when it came out in Chicago. I saw it in this rundown theater. I don't even remember. I don't know if the theater had a name. That's how rundown it was. But it was in an area I'd never been in before. And I believe it cost $2 to see the movie. But it was literally the only screen I could find that didn't show it in 3D. It was one of those kind of theaters where there's three rows and they're right. aluminum chairs. Yeah. And the screen is just a giant blanket with like a hole in the side of it. That was, I'm not kidding. That's literally the kind of wow. theater I went to. To get back to the gray world, though, my point with that was that uh, after the gimmicks have kind of worn off, right away, you're, first of all, she goes to her dad. You know, you're meeting her parents. And what does her dad tell her? Her dad says, oh, there's a new house. Explore. Go yeah. explore this new area we're in. Whether you're going to write down how many blue things you see or what. Not that there's a single fucking blue thing mm-hmm. in the hole, because it's all gray. Right. right? Uh, but telling her to explore. And then when you start to meet these neighbors... The neighbors are the ones that make the gray world colorful. Yeah. I mean, they are the only, the the fucking weird guy who lives upstairs with the mice. And you just, I still don't know what to make of this guy. A lot of, a lot of, I think his name's Babinski, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's one of the strangest things I think about just the way the stop motion is, is watching his fucking character move around yeah right it's odd and the character's odd but it's still odd and it it's almost as if he's bored with himself yeah it, it it's, still... it's mundane for him he's just working out whatever yeah. Here i got some new cheeses in the mail and even Coraline doesn't seem too entertained by no. by this guy doing fucking backflips off off the balcony or well, whatever it's because Coraline knows what's to come we we as viewers watch this and go wow this guy is kind of weird why isn't right. this like a more bizarre thing right why is this the first guy we're seeing yeah yeah sure yeah it's gonna get more entertaining mm-hmm. than this you know but we don't know that as an audience Coraline knows that because she's the fucking creative girl from the movie Movie. Right. So then that gray world serves as a almost as a transition. It serves as, you know what it is, the point of comparison. So that when we get button world, when we get the other world, it's so much it's already fantastic, but now it's fantastic by comparison too. Because we were just in the most mundane dull gray world where no one cared about anything. Mm-hmm. Now we're in button world and by comparison everything looks fucking magical. It looks brilliant. I mean, never mind the colors. The colors are, you know, an obvious thing. The weird uh the weird oddities I talked on the show a while ago about uh, when I was in Canada and it was like the U.S., but some things were just a little bit off right. and how much that threw me. Right. That's kind of what Button World is like. Okay. People have buttons for eyes. Uh, in your, Canada? Your mom makes it. Th- yeah. Oh. Have you never been to Canada? No. Now the Canadians are sending me hate mail. Fucking thanks. No, in the goddamn Button World from Coraline. People have buttons for eyes in Button World. You don't see the... Sorry, you were talking about Canada and then you were talking about how Canadians have buttons for eyes. All right, this is how the dynamic of this show works. I just pour all these thoughts out of my mind. And I try to tell you what it sounds like you're saying. (laughs) Right. All right, well, in fucking Button World, all of the stuff that should be fantastic in the normal world is actually fantastic in Button World. I mean, the mice circus, first of all. You actually get to see the mice circus. Right. Well, even Bobinski's mustache. Did you notice yes. this? This yes. I did not notice the first time going through. I swore I wouldn't get excited, and it takes a <laughs> fucking mustache yep. to get me pumped. But the, the he's got a weird spindly mustache and hairy shoulders in the gray world. Yep. And then he has a fantastic curled handlebar blue mustache in Button World. I know you're envious of those handlebar mustaches. You are such a fan of those. Well, he's everything... That his character wants himself to be, right. you know, in the other, sure. everything that Coraline wants his character to be. He is this, I mean, they dismiss him as a drunkard, right? He's drunk, he's delusional, he's, you know, living a dream or whatever. He's ordering cheese. Yeah, he's I mean, ordering really... cheese in the mail. That's, that's the kind of character he is. He orders cheese via UPS. But in the fantasy world, he, you know, that awkward body of his fits perfectly in a circus costume. Right. And that weird mustache of his forms perfectly into the handlebar mustache. He's no longer the creepy guy with, with the delusions from next door. Uh-huh. He really is pulling off this mice circus. And the circus itself is fucking fantastic. I mean, they all move in unison and there's this kind of uh, perspective shot. You know, I'm, I'm not talking too much about the stop motion because uh-huh. we talked about it a lot in Nightmare Before Christmas, but... This is one of the places where I think it's, it, well, it's showing off all over yeah. the movie. But to see all of these characters moving in unison and something that may even be easier when you're doing in stop motion. Yeah. If everyone moved in unison. Right, right that's probably easier. way But it looks so fantastic yeah. when you're watching it. 
That's not where the uh, the amazing circus sideshow ends. Right. The circus sideshows, by the way, another thing from Mirror Mask. Oh yeah, really? That's true. It's just, I totally forgot a lot about of, that. There's a lot of carny shit going on. So the sideshow continues with that. Uh, that's what is it? It's like a stage show. It's an opera. Yeah. It's, it's a, a, uh, well. There's this scene where the women from downstairs kind of they do a naked opera. Yes. Essentially, <laughs> yeah. um, all their creepy little Scotty terriers are sitting in the seats and yeah. Coraline watches a naked opera where they argue over whether it's sexier to be a mermaid or sexier <laughs> right. to be a naked chick in a clamshell. And then it ends with them peeling off their skin and diving into a bucket. I mean, that's an opera, right? That's pretty much every opera I've ever been to. Yeah, exactly. This, of course, being another thing that parallels to the real world. These women who seem, you know, past their prime. They used to be something amazing. And now in their old age, there's something that is mocked from afar to right. say those, just as you'd say the, the crazy guy who, you know, with the mice, these are the crazy women who stuff their terriers and right. um, read tea leaves. I already stuck one that's total bullshit in here. <laughs> I don't, ah, fuck it. That is total bullshit. Turns out tea leaves do not actually tell the future. Sorry about that. Everyone's really disappointed. All right. But this is the thing though. So we're starting to get what they're doing. They're just taking all the stuff from the gray world and they're adding color to it and they're showing you how exciting it might have been in its prime or more importantly, how exciting it is in Coraline's mind, mm -hmm. showing her how much better this world is than her normal world, how much better her parents are, what a, what, how much more of a fun time she'll have here, what a better life she'll have. And just when you've adjusted to that, you go, okay, I get this. How much longer would they do that? That's another one of those points where the film says, yeah, you know what? I know that right about here, you've gotten what we're doing, and now we're just having a fun time. We're no longer exploring and being creative. Right. I'm going to switch it up again. Yeah. So it turns out they have another world to show you. Mm -hmm. I mean, th this is where things get a little scary. People call this a scary film because they talk about it in the context of a children's right. film. Right. But if it gets scary, this is about the point. Yeah, I guess. Um, you have, you know, the mother revealing herself to be Cruella DeVille, essentially. Right. This is Cruella DeVille plus Terry Hatcher is what it turns yeah. into. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. I'll buy that one. And we'll get back to Mother in a second, but you actually think Mother's not the creepiest part of the other world. I just think that scene, the scene where Coraline gets thrust into the mirror cell, yeah. and the ghost children are all talking about how the mother ate their life yeah. and took their eyes. Whatever I mean, the hell that that's, means. That fucking shit is some, that's fucked up. Yeah, there's, right. there's one thing where you have a creepy woman with a wire hand. That's, yes. yeah, that's one realm of scary. Sure. But there are certain layers in hell for the, for the type <laughs> yeah, right. of people that do what those kids were describing. Right, right. Because as you talk about, I mean, wire hanger hand, that's Halloween scary. That's approachable scary. Yeah. You know, it's the person uh, during Halloween, the people who dress up as a ghost or dress up as Frankenstein, you go, whoa, right. scary costume. Uh -huh. But it's not actually terrifying. Stealing the lives, the life essence, the eyeballs yeah. of these children who are lost in some kind of dream limbo. Yeah, that's pretty messed up. It's the kind of thing that forces you to contemplate a lot of uh a lot of dark stuff that happens in the real world. Right. A lot of dark stuff about uh, you know, just from a broad sense, raising your child without letting them explore their own creativity, not having a childhood, all the way to the perverse of, you know, preying on children. Yeah. I mean, it covers a very wide range of real world evils. The thing that I love about uh, the reveal with her mom, with her other mother, is that she is the mastermind of this whole plan. Right. Uh, which is something a little unique because the movie's been throwing a lot of direct parallels at you. You see that, you know, the, the circus people are doing crazy circus stuff here and that her mom now cooks and her dad does gardening or maybe tidies up around the house. It's just the reverse of what you've come mm -hmm. to expect. So you may expect that both of her parents are the masterminds right. here, that the other parents are just a force like her regular parents, parallel to her regular parents that are trying to corrupt her into this other life. But instead, it's just her mom. Right. In fact, her mom is using everyone else as a puppet from the boy next door all the way to her father. Mm -hmm. I mean, her father is just this broken shell of a man. Yeah, well, he's literally really by sad. the end, yeah, yeah. he's fucking crying and apologizing while the big mantis tractor is oh, like... Oh, God, the mantis tractor is a little freaky, too. Yeah. <laughs> Something a little messed up about that. And that helps unify things. It gives it another side of the story. If it's just her mom and dad out to get her, her other mother and father out to get her, then she's just running away from two people. Right. But instead, you can run away from the mom... And you can approach the dad and see the kind of destruction that her mother was able to do mm -hmm. to someone, uh, which just makes her mother more of, of an oppressive foe. Right. 
So as that story starts to come to an end, you have, see even the, the performers have a darker side, you still get this constantly evolving world. I mean, eventually the house starts to decay. You get all the stuff with bugs. I mean, the house starting to decay is something we haven't really hit on, but something that we talked about with previous stop motion. Things they don't have to do. Yeah, they just But show they do off. anyway. It's showing off. They love it. We think about stop motion as no one does it because it's a huge pain in the ass. Right. But it turns out these people love doing it. And so they put in this little stuff. Well, it's stuff like the paint peeling. Yes. Stuff like the fucking snow globes. Yeah, right. Anything with water. Yep. Shit like that is just mind-bogglingly difficult. Right. Because here's the thing specifically with water. I'm thinking of like the tea leaves, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The difficulty with stop motion is that you have to move things fractions of centimeters right, right. between shots. You can't stop water from moving. Right, right. So if you need to make it look like water swishing around, you have to somehow get that done in real time. Right. And then figure out how to get everything kind else. Kind of composite that. Exactly. Yeah. Which is something you can do now with uh, with computer technology that you couldn't do back yeah. in the old 90s days. Where when you wanted to have a cloud, it was a cotton ball. Yep. And when you wanted to have water, it was, you know, crumpled up paper or something. Solid uh, plastic. Yeah, it was something that was solid and you had to make believe a little bit more. But I think the stop motion at this point has gotten so far that you can almost forget you're watching it. Yeah. And it becomes really, really immersive. Something that works for and against it. I mean, it's more immersive as a medium, but at the same time, like I said, that gimmick wears off. You yeah. can't just say, ooh, ah, stop motion the right. whole time. You have to have other creative ways of carrying the film, as Coraline clearly mm -hmm. does. You know, the one other thing we didn't hit on that I really like, and maybe this is just because I love Keith David, but the character of the cat throws yeah. me off, too, because it's this it's the same person, the same cat, right? You know, through the same character through all three of the different worlds, mm -hmm. through the ever-changing worlds, through everything that Coraline is going through. It's the only one she can identify with like herself, right. that is the same between each one. And not only does Keith David do an incredible job voicing the cat, mm -hmm. that guy just has such an amazing voice. He's one of those actors that you find everywhere, but at the same time you wonder how he's not really everywhere. Right. But it's an interesting you know, connection between those, something to unify all the worlds into kind of one place. I wanted to ask you one other thing, just specific to Coraline. Yeah. How do you think we're meant to feel about Coraline's parents, her actual real world parents? The thing that's strange about Coraline's parents is that I, every time I'm watching the film, in the beginning part, I feel like they're being total assholes. They're being right. neglectful parents. And I mean, on one hand, I've never parented a kid. I'm not going to parent a kid. Sure. And I don't know how annoying that might get, but I still think that there needs to be some semblance of... I mean, if you're having a kid, you have to deal with it, right? Yeah. So I feel like they're being neglectful. They're not doing parent stuff. They're not, right. they're, they're basically brushing her off saying, go do your own thing. Leave us alone. Right. We can't be nice to you all the time, right, I guess. Right. But then by the end, that knows that doesn't shape up. They're still kind of the same. And I don't know. It's hard for me to gate. I feel like they're being bad parents. Yeah, I but mean, it's difficult to gauge, and I don't know if the film wants me to feel that way or if it's just a byproduct of, of what they're doing. It does seem like the movie's trying to say something about that. Although, at the same time, it also says, you know, don't pay attention to this. This isn't what's important. Right. It's what's important on the bookends. It's why she goes into the other world, uh, but eventually comes back. I think that may say a bit more about her own life, her trust in people. Right, right, uh, right. You know, that relationship between her and her parents and why that's important rather than just if her parents are addiction. But, I mean, they just moved. They obviously have some kind of deadline to meet. Maybe they have excuses. Oh, we could argue back and forth all day about good parenting. But, yeah, <laughs> clearly not us is the answer yeah. to that question. Clearly not us. So Little Nemo kind of starts the same way. Mm -hmm. You get this little kid who's being neglected by his parents. And yeah. It's, it seem, this, this seems a little bit more innocent. I mean, maybe because it's from fucking 20 years earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, that could be it. And people just didn't have the balls to be bad parents on film, whether, yeah. you know, animated or stop motion. Right. The storyline of Little Nemo is really similar to Coraline. I got to give you credit for this one. It was your idea to pair these together, and I think yeah. they went together really well. Yeah, I was kind of surprised, too. Well, you just found this thing on DVD, right? This is yeah. pretty recent. Well, it was a film that I watched all the time as a kid. Yeah, Young, right. young, young child. I think the original film came out in 89, and I was watching it, renting it from Video Value, yeah. like, <laughs> weekly. Well, it came out 
out in 89 and then it didn't come to the states until 92 right so there was that still that three years there but i mean it didn't come out on dvd until really recently this was one of those things that uh it's rare that you find even in exploitation circles stuff like the, the stuff that hasn't come out on dvd right. before pen and teller get killed was really the only thing we've ever done yep. on the show that was so old and deemed unimportant but eventually that even came out on mm-hmm. dvd so this thing was fetching, you know, a hundred, two hundred dollars on eBay on VHS. Uh, so you had a prize item in your hand with that VHS. Yeah. And so finally, in twenty oh four, it comes out on DVD, and I right. go out and buy it, thinking, "Oh yeah, this is a fun." I mean, I didn't buy it going, "This is a great film." Right. I bought it going, "Nostalgia." This is, it's a little this nostalgia. This is a piece of my childhood. Sure. I might as well own this. I like film, and this is one of the films that I grew up on that right. no one's going to know about. Right. It's it's also interesting because this is the first time we've really covered a cult children's film yeah. on double feature mm-hmm. something that people remember from their childhood that does kind of fulfill the checklist of cult film yeah i mean that's why it fetched 200 dollars on fucking yeah on eBay. exactly i mentioned on our last show um having seen a, a tattoo of little nemo mm-hmm. pretty much every day for the last couple of years and having no idea what it was so my girlfriend's got one of these on her arm. It's a big piece from the original comic, the uh, Windsor McKay comic. Yeah. And I have to admit, and this is actually really sad, because this is something that is permanently etched on her body. I know nothing about it. Um, you know, she's really into films, too. She's doing directing now. She likes a lot of really obscure stuff. So sometimes when I see things permanently inked on her body, they frighten me away. Yeah. Uh, so what I was unaware of going into this because of that preconception i already had was that this would actually be fairly accessible Mm -hmm. i mean i suppose it's dark compared by the other standards yeah but uh certainly something that was fun and enjoyable and understandable and would work as a children's film right although i do understand that the original windsor mckay stuff was known for being really surreal and Mm -hmm. really dark and at times uh i guess violence is probably the right word yeah what i didn't know is actually this was a piece of my childhood as well uh, we always get hate mail when we talk about fucking video okay, games. But this is a, I think so this is So fuck an you guys. This is a, and here's why. Here's why this is an exception. Because I went through years of my life not knowing why I knew about this. Yeah. And tr- you ever, uh, you know, you see a movie or somebody says something and you go, oh, what was that? And it's on the tip of your tongue. Mm-hmm. Who was so-and-so in that movie? Or this actor was in some movie with this actor. What is that? And it annoys you for days. Yeah. This has annoyed me for decades. I don't know how long that that probably since fucking 1990 or whatever Mm -hmm. when it came out, but there was a little Nemo game. It was called uh, little Nemo, the dream master. I think Capcom made it way back in the nineties in 1990, I think before the movie had even reached the U S and the iconic image that I remembered from it was Nemo in his bed uh, flying along. Uh And I just couldn't put my finger on what that was. I think for people who haven't seen the movie, when you see it, you might remember a lot of the images that came from it because they've been used in other places and they're really inspirational to a lot of people. One of those people, uh, one of which being Alan Moore, who did the Watchmen stuff and has done a lot of great stuff with comic books, Uh, but another being Neil Gaiman, you know, who actually used Little Nemo in a lot of his stuff, most notably notably the Sandman. There was even a crossover in uh, one of the Sandman comics between, you know, Neil's characters and Little Little Nemo. Nemo. So that all kind of comes around and, I mean, so obviously, cult film here. We've got, what, Alan Moore. Okay, so if Alan Moore is being (laughs) inspired by... Alan Moore and Neil Gaiman is really the the double header there. And and all of this is coming out. This film comes out the same time Disney releases fucking, what, Aladdin? Yeah, Disney's releasing Bambi. Well, Bambi's a little old. But some of the stuff, the you know, the early 90s Disney stuff. Right, right. And... I mean, so you have this these two options for children to see right. the painfully, honestly, painfully safe Disney film yeah. with songs that are going to be stuck in your head yes. for too goddamn long. Yeah. Or you have this thing that's it's basically like a 90-minute Salvador Dali painting yeah, yeah. that goes on, and, and it teaches the same general moral values. Mm-hmm. It's, Even has songs. Yeah, it has <laughs> songs. It, it's yeah. more interesting. It's funnier. Yeah, probably. it's the underdog. Yeah. You know, it is the counterculture. I mean, all right, so now we've hit our big... There's a giant checkbox at the end of all cult film, of all cult anything, and it just says counterculture. Uh You can have, you know, remote influences, obscure references, but man, you get that fucking counterculture box right there. That's all you need. And so you have this empire that is Disney. 
I mean, we could never even talk about Disney because it's almost a separate art form yeah. from film itself. Yeah. You have movies and then you have Disney. You know, even to touch on the, the newer stuff, the Pixar stuff, we can talk about it as movies, but you almost need to talk to Disney people for that kind of stuff because, you know, they produce so many of these films. Uh, they use a lot of the same themes. There's so much called uh, the princesses, you know, yeah. the the aristocracy behind these these Disney movies. It's like talking about the work of an obscure director in that it's almost, like I said, talking about a different kind of art form. So we talk about the Empire of Disney, which I mentioned that way because I, you know, something inside me, because this is the counterculture we're talking about, yeah. wants to discount Disney. Yeah. I want to say, well, stupid fucking Disney movies and this other stuff. Mm-hmm. But the truth of the matter is Disney is so large, you can't write it off because right. it encompasses the good and the bad. Yep. You know, how fuck it would just be like saying we have horror films and then we have bullshit dramas. You yeah. know what I mean? Right. There's clearly a, a whole scope of what Disney's doing that sets it apart. But it's the juggernaut. Yeah. It's huge. And then we have the underdog right. of Little Nemo. And that's part of where I think that cult status really comes yeah, in. Yeah, for sure. Um, the Disney stuff, everybody's going to talk about Aladdin from when they were a kid. But man, if you know little, and I can attest to this from my girlfriend because we will get stopped in public and someone will say, oh my God, a little Nemo and talk to her about it. I mean, this is something that fewer people like far more in, in quantity yeah. uh, in greatness than a lot of the Disney stuff. All right. One other thing before we dive straight into Slumberland, uh, who's attached to this stuff with the screenplay? Cause this is kind of crazy. Well, the screenplay, there's two big names mm-hmm. that I like to chuck at people. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I just go little Nemo. How about Chris Columbus? Yeah. And fucking Ray Bradbury. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think Ray Bradbury's name ended up on the final one. Right. But uh, Chris Columbus's name did. We talked about Chris before as, uh, let's say, a failure of a director and a fantastic writer. Mm. And it's even kind of debatable how much he had to do with the final product. But at one point, George Lucas was even attached to this. In the early, early days when they were trying to get the production on the film going, I think they had problems with some of the plot stuff. I'm not really sure what the details were there. Mm. But it seems like this uh, this has been shopped around to quite a few different writers. To make a perfect segue, of course, from writers right. is uh, the kind of gimmick, the writing gimmick of yeah. this story. So the thing about kids' movies, and this parallels, again, this parallels Coraline in a fantastic way. Mm-hmm. Where if if you're bored watching something like Aladdin, you're bored watching something where the world is based in the world that you're in and everything kind of has to follow at least some semblance of, let's say, I don't know, physics. Yeah. <laughs> Little Nemo, from the very beginning of the film, betrays everything going on all the time for the sake of getting the story and keeping it interesting every step of the way. Yeah, it's a world completely without rules. As you mentioned, even the rules of physics. Right. You know, when you were talking about Coraline, too, that's another interesting uh, thing to talk about is cult film, because Coraline today is kind of, as we talked about with Little Nemo, the alternative to all this big budget Pixar, not even Pixar, but I mean all of the CG kids movies. Right. Just the art form they were using on that makes that separate. Um, So you see that kind of creativity in that movie, and you certainly see it here. I would say you almost see it more in the mechanism they're using right. than anything else. Because with having the one rule of no rules, there's pretty much no place you can't go. Exactly. And and there's no and the the better part of being able to go anywhere is that you can go there at any time from any other place. <laughs> yeah, right. There are scenes where what, they open a door and then they're in a room that's an upside down yeah. banquet hall. Sure, and why the not? tables are for some reason stuck to the ceiling. However, yeah. they are gravitated downward. Right. And so by sitting on a table, it pulls the table downward, and then Nemo falls onto a spiral staircase and slides <laughs> right. down and lands next to a train. Right. Yeah, a train that he and a very large man can ride. Uh th- again, to talk about paintings, you know, you mentioned Dolly. But uh, to ride through these staircases that are on walls and yeah. ceilings and upside down and uh, physics out the window. The whole story just kind of, it, it's just a soaring story arc. Yeah. It just starts and everything that happens is completely, there's no downtime for anything going on in the film. Everything that's happening is is action. There's always something going on. And there's basically two, there's, the story's divided into three parts. Mm -hmm. The parts are divided by Nemo waking up in his, I say that, you know, figuratively, whatever, but it's him waking up in his bed with different aspects of the story, you know, still around him. And uh, you get two basic places. You get Slumberland, 
which I don't, I can't even understand. I cannot get no, my you can't head around it. You know, it's an interesting uh, to look at the whole movie that way. It's kind of a case study of what's possible when you can focus all your attention on imagination. Yeah. With literally no constraints from a, from a plot standpoint. Uh, Slumberland is just a place, quite simply, where anything can happen, no rules whatsoever. Right. And it's amazing because it seems like they do something and you go, well, this will be important. Example, a lot of times they fall into water. Yeah. And you immediately go, okay, well, now they'll be underwater. And then for some reason, the film goes, no, they're just going to, it's <laughs> right. no water. Yeah. We went underwater and now we're underwater, which yeah. is why this manta ray can fly. <laughs> However, <laughs> right. we're just going to fall into a swamp. Yeah. Underwater swamp. Yeah, I mean, the bed will sink under the water. You don't need oxygen underwater. But then later, the bed is floating on the water. It's how they stay afloat. Uh, the other thing I like about that is not just the things they do, but who Nemo is. Right. You know, eventually, he becomes the prince. That's where the story's kind of going, training him to be mm -hmm. the prince. But he's also a, a train engineer. I yeah. mean, he fixes the, right. the train because he knows, apparently, how trains right. work. Yeah. Uh, you could just be any... It's a fucking dream. You can be anything you want. Mm -hmm. You also have uh, Icarus, who's a flying squirrel, who just, oh, wait, that's in real life. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so that's the craziest part, right? It's right. not not that right. there's a flying squirrel hanging out with him. He's his buddy yeah. in, in these dreams. But I love the end. This is a spoiler, by the way, about yeah. flying squirrels, if you care about spoilers. Uh, in the end, he wakes up, and his parents are like, oh, nice dream there. Hey, how you doing? Let's go out to the circus. You can bring your flying squirrel, <laughs> <laughs> who I just assumed was you know part of the, right. uh, the imagination yeah. aspect. When we're first dealing with a lot of the dream stuff, I feel like there's a really good anti-authoritarian kind of uh, plot thread to it. Just actually, it's just an overall feeling. I mean, right from the entire premise, you know, you're saying no to your parents. The, this whole right. thing about his parents not paying attention to him or not being imaginative. Not letting him steal what, pies. <laughs> not letting him steal pies. So he basically says, all right, fuck you parents. I'm just, I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to go to my own world. So there's something that's obviously anti-authoritarian mm. about that, about being a child in general. But more right. specifically, he's saying no to reality. Yeah. You know, we talked about this with all the physics yeah. stuff. I mean, he's saying even to the laws of the universe, fuck you, I'm going to do whatever I want my way. And then you eventually get to Flip, who's a character who, at least at the time, we believe is uh, has a search warrant out for him. Yeah. Because he has fun. He's having right. too much fun. Another thing that's really anti-authoritarian is even the king of Slumberland is playing hooky. Yes. <laughs> I yeah, mean, right. He's supposed to have this meeting and he's like, no, I want to play with my train. It's like, yeah, who, right. who is governing him and why is yeah. it, why he goes away and, and, and pretend he, he hides his cape. So yeah, it looks yeah. like he's still there, but he's actually not. <laughs> still busy at work. I mean, yeah. it seems like even he, the man without a boss, is is trying to pull one over on everybody because he wants to do what he wants to do. Almost seems like satire of that Disney right. situation where, you know, a lot of it is the prince and the princess and the king and the queen, that kind of European system right. of government that's looked up right. to for some sick, twisted reason. Uh, here we're saying, yeah, he's a king, but only because this is a fairy tale. Right. He's really a train engineer. Yeah. So then, yeah, we get Flip, who is voiced by Mickey Rooney, who is yeah. pretty much the only name. As far as we can tell now. Goes. Yeah. And he's this, he's this character that starts out, you know, I have too much fun. He smokes cigars all the time, yeah. which is actually a really funny element to his character because there's a, you can't smoke. And then he goes, fuck you. I'm going to smoke. Right. Right. Then you get the thing at the end with the giant cigar. Yeah. It's just, it, he does whatever he wants. Everybody in this film is kind of just doing what they want to do. They're individuals without any kind of constraint. And it turns out that Flip kind of hangs out with Nemo, you know, stick with me. We're going to have fun. And then he influences Nemo who totally takes full responsibility, which, mm -hmm. you know, props to that kid yeah, yeah. for unleashing this, this almost hexus, like you remember uh, yeah, Fern Gully, sure. this hexus, like nightmare tar yeah. that swallows the king. It's a really horrendous scene, yeah. especially as a child. Yeah. Cause the way the tar moves coming up the stairs. Oh, and the, the little red, uh, the yeah. red eyes. It, yeah. It looks really cool. It's really fantastic. Um, especially now that we're dealing with, you know, what's pretty old animation, right. um, using a lot of the older techniques, right. which you can spot now as an adult, of course, but man, still that black essence, right. red eye creepy. Oh, it's fantastic. And it's just kind of this, it's this interesting testament to, you know, if you goof around, if you have too much fun, if you hang out with the wrong people, 
this horrible thing might <laughs> right. happen. I mean, right. it's it's a definitely it's the an warning. O- it's an it's overbearing the, yeah. warning to say the least. But at the same time, I really enjoy that Flip, this character who's always having fun, he Benny Hills the police. Yeah, you know yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, that little Scooby Doo scene in there. Even he, it, it's out of his hands. He yeah. doesn't even want that kind of horrific thing to happen. Yeah. And once it does, once it's unleashed. Everybody who's been doing their own thing the whole time is caught off guard. Right. And it's kind of like the only true authority. It's like the only true authority in Slumberland is danger. Yeah, that's good. It's the cautionary tale that's coming back to haunt them. And that's really all it is. That's all that keeps them in line. That and their musical numbers about right. uh, what was etiquette. the number about? Yeah, about etiquette. I like that you pointed that out, that we could have gotten a montage there. Right. And instead... We just got a musical number about, uh, you know, teaching Nemo to become a prince. All movies should follow that. When you think you're going to stick in a montage, put in a musical number instead. And still, let's just try that. I'm not sure it's going to work. Let's just try that as a big experiment and just see how film changes as a result. So, all right. The darkness is creepy and awful. But the Nightmare King, (laughs) he has such a pleasant a pleasant's really the word yeah he has a pleasant voice he seems like a really nice guy it's almost it's it sounds like tim curry and clue yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> not scary tim yeah. curry it's whimsical tim yeah. curry uh it's not tim curry at all it's like <laughs> Maybe oh it i'm be. scared of pajamas right and he thinks he can give an evil cackle once in a while yeah. and that's gonna make you know that's the only time i'm reminded that he's a villain he says something uh bombastic like that uh-huh. and then he says what uh, uh. But of course, he eventually, you know, defeats the the nightmare darkness. But I mean, at that point, you know, so much has happened up to that point that I've completely forgotten how they got. He goes back and he apologizes for opening the forbidden door. And I had to stop and go, wait, 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 what forbidden door? Was that after training, but before the nightmare world? Or where was that in relation to the, the Slumberland smoking ban? Right. I, mean, I don't, re- but you know, I remember yeah. eventually back to that. It just seems so, I mean, by the time he wakes up, he seems like he's got energy to start the day. I feel exhausted. Yeah, well, it's a very forward-moving film. That's what I like about it. That's why I think it's such a great, it's a great thing for kids comparatively to Disney. Yeah. Because Disney's grounded in reality. It's grounded in making decisions. It's grounded in formulating plans. And Little Nemo is grounded in entertaining you. After missing out on all the uh, more subtle, old-school Windsor McKay stuff, my girlfriend is probably going to leave me. What are we doing next time on the show? You uh, know, next- we have some things, actually. Yeah, we do. Are they new? What is this stuff we're doing? On well, the, we've, we got, got a- we've got a website on the yes. internet, which right. is uh, doublefeatureshow.com. So is there anything new and amazing on there? Uh, this show will actually be up oh, on there. That is right really now. cool. And then next really cool. week, there will be yet another show. That's So they just keep putting shows up on that site? Weekly. That's fantastic. Uh, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com is the email address. Actually, if you want to educate me about Little Nemo, I'm saying this really quietly so no one hears you can send an email there and I will read up about the subject matter. You know what else might be interesting because we've done so much Disney bashing this episode. Send us some info about some Disney stuff. If you think there's a Disney movie that does something interesting we could talk about or one that is, I was going to say one that uh, is a good representation of all Disney films, but then people are just going to send us their fucking favorite and I don't want that. So you think you got something good on the Disney angle. I would not be totally against doing some kind of Disney something on the show. If it works, it works. In the meantime, we have two, uh, they're kind of like Disney films. What are we yeah. doing next time on the show? Uh, we're going to do Stage Fright, which is a slasher film. <laughs> oh. And Phenomena. So those are actually not Disney films. Probably all. not. All right. Here's what you need to know. Stage Fright is more commonly called Deliria, but if we title the episode Deliria plus Phenomena, it sounds stupid. So we're not going to do that. Right. And uh, Phenomena in the U.S. is called Creepers, but no one actually calls the movie Creepers. So we're not going to call it that either. Okay. So Stage Fright is not the Hitchcock Stage Fright, right. but rather the uh, slasher movie Stage Fright, the one we've referenced before with the owl head. And we will talk about some of that stuff. And then Phenomena, this is a terrible place to start with this, but I'm going to do my homework so it'll be okay. Phenomena is a Dario Argento movie. That's a loaded one. Um, I picked one to, to start off. I picked Phenomena, which I think is one of the more ridiculous and it'll fit more in line with the slasher stuff before, you know, if we choose to venture out deeper mm-hmm. into Argento territory. But while you're going to approach this um, lesser known Italian 
odd brand of classic horror, I think that's probably a good, but we'll start a little bit surface and we'll just dig down a little bit there. So those are the two. Go out and find those movies. Good luck finding them under their weird alternate titles. All right. Watch more fucking film. Bye.